Good morning, Kevin here. Where am I today? Well, first of all, I've got Sue. She's with me. Hi. So we are in the Derbyshire Dales, yep. in the Peak District. And as you can see, Haddon Hall. This is our first stop today. So we're going to be doing several visits, places to go. So we'll see how we get on. So let's press on. Yep. Can we do that? Yep. Okay, cool. We're in, we've been accepted. <laughs> so we've got a, the, the hall is actually just over top of that hedge there. We're heading up this way. The first bit we're gonna find is a cafe. Yep. Gotta get a cup of coffee. But just look, this part of the countryside here. Loads and loads of trees. It's a lovely day again. Temperatures are about 20 degrees at the moment. It's about 11 o'clock. Yep. 11 o'clock. So we're going over the bridge, first of all, and that takes us to the restaurant. That's the, hang on, let me, let me just show you this. That's the first view of the hall from the track, or road that we're going in by. So let's have a look at this bridge. Here we go over this wonderful bridge very low parapets on it but i think this is the river why just look at that crystal clear water isn't that fantastic let me show you going through the other way look at that Isn't that fantastic? <clears throat> I think this is a two, two, oh, um, yeah, it is. We've got two arches to this bridge. I was just double checking, so it felt as if there should be more. <clears throat> So we've got Sue there taking photographs of the hall. So Sue's, Sue's responsible for taking all the photographs but while well, we're out and about. I can't really get round to have a look at the, the side of the bridge. Can't really see anything from here. There is, it does look like there's a footpath just over there. I don't know whether I can get down there or not. Well, Sue and I have just had a, some toast and cup of tea and a cup of coffee. So these are the stone steps heading up into the hall. I don't know how much commentary I'm going to be able to give going round because there are a lot of people here. So it may be that I do have to do um, a bit of audio over the top. So let's see how we go. Huge doorway going in. Stone built Hall. Just show you the views from the front entrance. Look at these roses, as Sue's just said about across the front here, the main entrance. That must have been the gate, entrance gateway there. Look at that up there. But there's an entrance talk which we're going to see if we can gate crash. <clears throat> I'd like to welcome you to Hatton Hall here today. Um, a lot of people arrive at this point and they think they've come to a castle because after all, it has all the attributes of a castle. It's on a hill, it's got towers, it's got crenellations. But Haddon Hall isn't a castle. It's what's known as a fortified house, <laughs> which is basically a house with a big wall around it to stop people coming in and stealing your possessions. And Haddon is reputed to be the best preserved example of a fortified house anyway. And the reason it's so well preserved is down to two quirks of 
8. Um, the first happened at the end of the 17th century. The family inherited the titles to the Rutland, and with it went a real castle over in Leicestershire <coughs> called Beaver Castle. Now, Beaver Castle had just been rebuilt after the Civil War, and so the family had a choice. Do they move to a brand new house, or do they stay here at this, by then, 500-year-old house? Well, not surprisingly, they're up sticks, and they all left. And they loved to have none. And they didn't come back here for another 200 years. Now, in that 200-year period, a lot of changes happened to houses this old in England. A lot of them had wings put on them. A lot of them had their gardens remodeled. But none of that happened at Haddon. They just sat and slowly declined. And it would have continued decaying had it not been for the second quirk of fate. If you cross this courtyard, go through the archway, you go into the chapel. And in the chapel is an effigy of a young boy. Had that boy grown up, he would have become the ninth Duke of Rutland. But he died young, and his younger brother inherited the title. And fortunately for us, his younger brother became one of the leading specialists in medieval history in the country. An eminent archaeologist who dug with Howard Carter. You can see his effigy as you come into the Great Hall there. You can't miss him, he looks like Dracula. <laughs> um, he realised when he inherited this place just how rare it was. And he made it his life's work to restore it. And it cost an absolute fortune. He had to sell 40,000 acres of land and property to pay for the restoration of Haddon Hall. The current owner is the 29th generation of his family to have owned this house. And they can trace their family line right back to just after the Norman Conquest, to a family of knights called the Avenels who came over with William the Conqueror. And they started building here at Haddon Hall. And they started building there. If you look through the window, you'll see the entrance. That's the main entrance to Haddon Hall. In fact, it's the only vehicular entrance to Haddon Hall. And you might think, well, hang on, that part's right at the bottom. Why on earth have they put the entrance halfway up a hill? In the Norman period, where youth park was all swamp, no one in their right mind went to the bottom of that hill. All the roads and all the people went over the top of the hill. And the paths are still there, so that's why the entrance is up there. Um, we don't know an awful lot about the his early history of Haddon um, until the 12th century, when it had passed through marriage to a family called the Vernons. Now, as you come up the hill, you might have noticed topiary in the gardens. Yeah? Did you notice the boar's head? Yes. Big boar's head. You'll see the boar's head a lot going around Haddon today, because that's the symbol of the family that responsible for most of what we see today, the Vernon family. Yeah. They inherited the house and the first solid date we've got is 1194 because they wanted to build this big defensive wall around the house. Now in those days you didn't apply to the council for a wall, you applied to the king. And the king was very, very reticent of seats of power being established around the country. So he said, yep, you can have a wall around Haddon, but it can't be high, any higher than 12 feet, and it's not allowed to have any crenellations. So all of these towers, all of these crenellations, they're all later, and they're purely decorative. Um, the Vernons added each successive generation, built a bit more. It was originally an open courtyard until they built this in 1390, the Great Hall. And with it, they built their kitchens down there, which some of you would have been to have talked about already. The greatest of the Vernon family was a man called Henry Vernon. Now, Henry lived in turbulent times. He was 
living in the 15th century, uh, when we're in the middle of the War of the Roses, where the House of Lancaster was fighting against the House of York. He had married the Earl of Shrewsbury, one of the most powerful Lancastrian families in the country. But he was very, very good friends with the House of York and their king. And both sides were asking him to go and fight. What should he do? Well, some of the stories said he actually, he'd, he'd actually um, take part in some of the battles. But most historians think he did nothing. He just waited and just saw who was the eventual victory. victory. Um, but whatever he did, he must have done okay. Because when Henry VII came to the throne, Henry VII asked Henry Vernon to bring up his eldest son, Prince Arthur, era and more. Um, Arthur died young, and his younger brother became king. His younger brother being Henry VIII. And Henry VIII gave this tapestry here to have more. It's the coat of arms of Edward IV. And if you go into the room behind this, you'll see a typical Tudor room. Very heavily panelled. Um, you'll notice on the ceiling a checkerboard pattern, which is typical of, of a Tudor room. Um, it's also got the combined rows of the Rose of Lancaster with the Rose of York, called the Tudor Rose. And if you look in the bay window, you'll see a carving of Henry VII and of his wife, Elizabeth of York. Um, interestingly enough, Elizabeth of York, if you look at the carving, you might recognise her. She was the person who is depicted on the playing cards as the Queen of Hearts. So have a look at that. Um, Henry, as I say, was a very powerful man. His grandson was the last of the Vernon line. Um, he had no male heirs, but he had two daughters. And the story of how the house of how the house passed to the current owners, the manors, was one of the legends that grew up about Adam Hall. Um, in those days, fathers tried to marry off their daughters to the household that were bringing the most to theirs. Um, but unfortunately, his youngest daughter, Dorothy, had other ideas. Now, Dorothy was the, described as being the most beautiful woman in all Garnish. And if you want to make up your own mind, go up these steps, turn right, and there on your right is a picture of her. Now, you can make up your own mind about that. But anyway, she was so beautiful, um, a young man fell in love with her. But he was a second son. And second sons inherited very little. So not surprisingly, her father, George Vernon, the big Dorothy, and married this man. But, so the story goes, during the night of her elder sister's wedding, she crept out along the long gallery, down the steps that bear her name, out down the terrace garden. And there you'll see a little bridge over the river. Across the bridge, and there she met John Manners. And she rode away into the night and was married. Two years later, her father dies, she comes back and inherits her. So, how much of that do you think is true? Well, she did marry John Manners, and she did ride away and secretly marry him, and inherited this house two years later. And the rest is largely made up. And it's made up by the people who were tasked with looking after the house in the 200 year period it was supposed to be locked up. For the porters, for a small fee, would take people off going to the And they would make up fanciful tales about the history of the house. And this tale of Dorothy Vernon gained a lot of momentum in the Victorian <coughs> period, the Romantic period. And books were written about it. And Sir Arthur Sullivan, Gilbert and Sullivan Frame, even wrote a light opera called Dorothy Vernon of Hatton Hall, which by all accounts was the worst piece of music that he ever wrote. <laughs> <laughs> um, and we know that it's largely made up because the long gallery 
she and her husband had designed and the steps she designed with her husband and the gardens her and her husband got laid out um, and if you go in upstairs you go into the long gallery um, that they designed and it's um, it's a room that's meant to impress visitors it was designed uh, in, in the Elizabethan period exercise was all the rage right like now and I know it's hard to imagine, but Derbyshire sometimes gets inclement weather. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to follow, like and subscribe to Kevin's Rambles.